much. What's going on, brother? Thanks so much for joining the show today. Jesse T, what's up, bro? Thanks so much for having me. Everything. I've, I've, I've been uh, chasing you for a while and trying to connect with you in a sense. Uh, was referred by a good uh, friend of ours, Zach Knight, local business owner here in Atlanta, Georgia, doing great things with his podcast and his purpose. Um, it's the man. He's the man. He's a, he's a huge... Uh, addition to, to my life, just adding tons of value. He is the man for sure. Um, and he said that we should connect. So here we are. Awesome. Yeah. Happy to. Yeah. So thanks so much. And, and for those, uh, you know, listening, Travis is the founder of, of one of the top highest rated podcasts that there is out there in terms of entrepreneurship and things that you should listen to. It's called build your network podcast. And so we'll delve into all those things. He's a podcast consultant. I'm sure he has some other entrepreneurial endeavors we could probably share, but, uh, wanted to, share the world a little bit more about your story, what, what you've done, what you've created, uh, what you're currently doing to build your own network um, and make connections for people and for yourself and share some ideas with, with uh, listeners so they can kind of do some of the same things in their lives. Let's do it, man. Yeah. So, so bring it back, man. Tell me a little bit about the journey. How'd you get started and how'd, how'd you get into what you're doing today? Uh, yeah, great question. So I was um, I, basically just a, a door-to-door salesman. I came out of uh, college. I started doing door-to-door sales in college and then uh, was making way more money doing that than the thing that I was going to college for. So uh, after I graduated college, I just kind of kept going into the sales world, the sales route, the path, I guess. Um, and uh, I, I was I was only doing it for the money, obviously. I mean, nobody does door-to-door sales just for the passion of door-to-door sales, right? I was, it was, I was only in it for the money, and um, and that's fine for some people. But for me, after like the first year or two of do, like the first real year that I was doing it full time, um, I just kind of realized like that it wasn't the path that I wanted to continue to go down. Not that there's anything wrong with it. I have a lot of friends that still do it, and they do really, really well financially um, in a small amount of hours uh, uh, in the, in that industry. But for me, it just wasn't exactly the path that I wanted to continue to go down. So I uh, came, I was 22 at the time, 21, 22. And uh, it was my first full year, full-time door-to-door sales. And when I say full-time, it wasn't super full-time. Like we would go out and knock. So there's typically two ways to knock. There's um, the summer program guys, and then there's the year round guys. So some guys will just go out from like May to September and they'll put in 10, 12 hour work days and they'll pull six figures in a summer and then they'll be done. Um, I was a year round, uh, part of a year round crew. So we were always knocking, but we didn't put in 10, 12 hour days. We'd put in three, four hour days and we'd go out at times where people were most likely to be home. So we'd probably work like 20, 25 hours a week. And, uh, but that year was the first year that I pulled in six figures and uh, was just knocking on doors and uh, selling alarm uh, systems. And at the end of the year, it was really kind of counterintuitive because I feel like most 22 year olds wouldn't have come to this decision because I, you know, I just pulled six figures and I was uh, working 20 hours a week. Um, on the weekends, I would just go to uh, the guy who owned the company would just go over to his house and we'd just party and have a good time. And uh, we, you know, we'd got some good traveling in and at, at a 20 hour work week, I got up when I wanted to and I you know, would go to the gym and then I'd come home, play video games for a couple of hours and then go out, knock on a door, sell, like sell a deal, come back home. Like it was a pretty solid setup, you know, but um, I just knew at that time that I had already kind of hit a ceiling at that place. Um, like the most, I, I, I could have doubled the, the amount of time that I was working. Sure. Um, but it wouldn't have doubled my income or production, uh, just because it's not the efficient times to be out on doors maybe would have increased. Like if I would have worked my ass off and like really got out there and hustled after it, I probably could have, you know, pulled an extra 30, 40% on my income, but that was that was basically it. And that was kind of scary for me as a 22 year old to be looking at that and going, man, at 22, I'm already kind of hitting, like bumping up against the ceiling of where this is. And it was just kind of, you know, suffocating and, and, and made me a little bit fearful of continuing on there. Cause I looked 10 years into the future and I was just like, man, 10 years in the future, it looks the same exact way that it looks right now. You know, like pulling like 130, 140 
knocking on doors every day. Like it just did not seem like what I wanted in my future. So I, uh, I, for the first time in my life really dove into personal development up to that point. I, I wasn't a big personal development guy. I was more of the guy that was like, you know, I, I was more the guy that would make fun of the people reading the books because the people reading the books seemed to be the people that were just like kept reading and theorizing all the time and they were never actually doing anything, um, which I still have a problem with, by the way, if you're just a reader and then you never implement anything, like what's the point of reading? Um, but I, I did kind of demonize reading because I was using it as an excuse as to why I didn't read and, and do that kind of stuff. And so uh, when I, my back was kind of against the wall at that point in my life and I was just kind of like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Um, the degree that I had gotten was in uh, double majored in Bible and church ministry. So that wasn't the path that I was going to go down. And so I was just kind of at a standstill, didn't know what to do and had no idea like what to pick up next. I thought about everything at that point, bro. I thought about, I looked up like FBI applications. I looked up um, uh, fire department uh, stuff. I, I like, I, th I thought I pondered a lot of different career paths um, at that time in my life and um, eventually just found, uh, discovered podcasts and, uh, uh, audiobooks and stuff, and just started tearing through a bunch of content and uh, came across this guy's show. His name is John Lee Dumas, has a show called Entrepreneurs on Fire. And I started listening to that show a bunch and hearing him talk about podcasting and how um, how it's you know a viable way to make income and you get to talk to people that are awesome and interview them and ask questions. And I was like, oh, that sounds super intriguing, right? And I, I felt like I'd always had a propensity toward being uh, decent at, at um, like writing in school. Uh, I was, I wouldn't call myself a writer and I definitely didn't call myself a writer at that point. Uh, but I would notice a clear difference between like a paper that I would turn in for a project versus a paper that like friends of mine would turn in for a project. It was just like, there was just a stark difference to me. And I was like, I, this, it seems like this is something that I could be good at, but I did not enjoy it at all. Um, and so podcasting was just kind of like, Oh, you know, it's, it's basically just like audio blogging. And like, I feel like I would, I feel like I would way more enjoy doing the audio version of a blog rather than having to like write all the time. It didn't excite me. Um, so, uh, just kind of after listening to him for a while, I figured out like, man, I should probably, you know, just go ahead and get started. And so I jumped in and, uh, hired a coach, uh, went to JLD's house uh, at a mastermind that he hosted out there. And then it was off to the races for me. And uh, that was like my first, you know, stint to the online world for sure. I didn't ever, I didn't ever make money online uh, to that point in my life. It was just kind of a, a first for me, a, an entry point to get into, you know, this whole, this whole online business world. Man. So lots to unpack there and some similar pathways, um, you know, going back to door to door sales, that's where I cut my teeth in, in, in uh, it was business to business. It was a little bit different, but I am familiar with the, the residential, the res side a little bit. Um, my business partner for a while, he handled the res side and I handled the B2B side. Nice. For thinking. what product? Uh, it was a company. It's still, I think in existence, it's called smart circle and it's got these little coupons. Basically you sell them for sports teams, restaurants, hotels, golf courses. And it was like Groupon before Groupon was big. Like, so we would sell gotcha. excess inventory at these places. And there was a management training program that was attached to it where if you could sell, recruit, train, you could essentially open up your own office wherever that would be. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, so, um, typical direct sales type of a structure. Yeah. Yeah. The promotion, the opportunity, the money, the fame, the glory, you know, all the yeah. uh, cultish type behaviors. Sure. Um, but, but for you, I know there haven't been a lot that that had served. Obviously you were making money at a young age, but um, what are some of the skills from the outside sales game? Cause there's a lot of salespeople that listen to this. Like what were the skills that you feel like that kind of perpetuated to the present day that you learned from that, that career? Yeah. Uh, countless man. Uh, anytime I talk to a young person and they ask me like, Oh, what should I be doing? I tell them like, go get a sales job go do sales. Like it doesn't have to be door to door. Um, cause that's kind of a hardcore version of just getting a sales job. Uh, but, uh, you know, go do sales, go do sales because you can't substitute the reps of talking to people. Um, meaning that I, like, I'm a big proponent of reading and personal development and audiobooks, And, you know, I've gone through three or four books this year already. It's my goal to go through 50 this year. And, um, I, I'm a big proponent of that kind of stuff, but ultimately, you can read a dozen sales books a day, but until you go out there and talk to people, 
it's going to do you no good. Like you have to go talk to people. And so, um, the bit, the biggest takeaway that I could come from door to door sales is probably the emotional intelligence that you get, um, by just talking to that many people, man, you just talk to so many people, um, that if you, if you have any goal to stick in it in the long term, which I did, um, you know, a lot of people don't make it, especially in a hundred percent commission door to door where there's no hourly, there's no base pay. Like you don't sell, you don't get paid. Um, a lot of people don't make it in that. And, uh, so if you can be one of the people that does, you're talking to so many people and you have to be able to start reading body language, start reading facial expressions, start listening to tonality, um, start asking the right questions. Like you have to get really good at, at, uh, at capturing attention up front. You know what I mean? Like, and all that stuff translates directly to everything else in business. Um, even like when I had coach people on podcasting, and I'm talking about their introductions. I'm like, you got, you got about 10 to 15 seconds at the beginning of your intro to convince people to listen to for another two or three minutes. And then you have another two or three minutes to convince them to listen for the rest of the episode. And that was exactly what I trained my daughter door guys on was like, look, you got like less than 10 seconds when somebody opens that door to convince them to listen to you for the next minute, minute and a half so that you can convince them to let you inside of their home to be like a consultant when they've never met you before like that. It's not an easy task to do. And so you learn, you start learning really quickly how to read people, um, how to tell if somebody's into what you're saying um, or not into what you're saying based on how they look, not based on what they're telling you because you know, buyers are liars. You know what I mean? So you have to be able to like read between the lines and see what's actually going on and get to the, get to the bottom of it. And you know, all that kind of stuff, you know, even just the sales language, the persuasive language to use, words to avoid, words to um, not avoid, um, even your, your, your own tonality, your own body language, how to get somebody. Cause I'm, I'm not a small guy. When I was knocking doors, I was actually, when I was my fattest. So, um, I was always an athlete growing up. I played college basketball and all that stuff, but then I injured myself, um, got surgery, got married and, um, and then started selling stuff. And so I jumped up to like 250 pounds. So I was like 6'1", 240, 250 pound guy knocking on somebody's door. Like that's not necessarily, you know, super welcoming. You know what I mean? When you open the door, like I, I'm not, I'm, I'm a fairly intimidating person is what I mean. So like you have to learn how to, how to negate that, how to stand in a certain way that makes you seem less intimidating, how to talk in a certain way, how to use certain um, tonality to, to come across as less intimidating and come across as an expert that people should trust and let in their home. Like there's a lot of stuff, man. There's a lot of stuff that you can, that you can take away from something like that. And the, the probably the coolest thing about it is it's, it's a earn while you learn type of a situation. So you're not in college learning from professors who've never done the thing that you want to do and, um, and having to pay them a ton of money to do it. Like you're out there every day learning like crazy while you're making a six figure income or whatever, you know, it is that you're making. So that's, I mean, uh, there's so many lessons to take away from it, but those are a few of them. Yeah. I, I know people that have, have, uh, done really well with their careers that started off with door to door sales in some capacity of business res, whatever it was. And hearing you tell your, your story, like brings back a ton of fun memories um, and just kind of some ideologies with, within sales. And so um, you must've had a pretty good icebreaker trying to get people to look at this six foot one, you know, bigger dude when they open the door and say, Hey, like whatever that was, what, what, what was some of the things you led with to get people to chill? Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't focus on words at all. Like, again, it was a very much like tonality and body language. So, um, the, one of the biggest things is just the way that you stand. Um, and, uh, so what I would do is I would always stand at an angle, um, because you never want to stand like confrontationally, uh, sure. that body language just means that like, it's me versus you. Whereas if I stand like this and I'm like showing them stuff on something, like we're in a collaborative team effort type of a thing. Um, so that would, that would, uh, that was one thing that I would do. Um, and then uh, one thing that I would do when I would knock on the door is I know that a bunch of people like look at the, look through the peephole and decide if they want to open the door or not. So like every four, like every three to five seconds, I would just like look at the peephole directly and I would just give a little wave like that um, because it increased my odds of them opening the door. And if somebody's like waving and like a quick smile like that, you know, it, it looks like, first of all, they're like, damn it, they heard me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they feel bad. So they have to open the door at that point. Um, even though I had no idea that they were standing behind the door, but it would also just, 
um, when you see like a, a little bit of a smile and a quick wave, um, it just takes their, their guard down a little bit. So when they open the door, now I'm standing at this angle. And then instead of going into like, hey, how's it going? My name is Travis. And this like big smile and like overbearing energy. It was very much uh, um, like when you talk loudly and if you're listening in your car right now, and, and, you know, you hear me say something like, Hey, how's it going? What's up? My name's Travis. Like you're, and these, you're initially like reaching for the volume to turn it down, right? Like your initial reaction is to pull away, yeah. even though that's how most people are trained to do sales, right? Is to be all super friendly and happy and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it, your initial reaction is to pull away from somebody like that. So what I would do is I would just talk really quietly in a tone that's very similar to the way that I'm talking right now and very uh, matter of fact and um, kind of more like a question type tonality um, where your your intonation kind of goes up at the end, even though you're saying facts, you know, like some like that. Does that make sense? So oh, yeah. you're just taking the edge off a little bit. Um, and uh, and uh, just those small things, man, like they, they make a huge difference. I learned very quickly that um, when you're talking to, you know, 50 to a hundred people in a day, if you can do things every single time, every single interaction, if you can do some things that increase the percentage of you getting in that door or you closing a deal, if you can increase that percentage by three or four points, every, like with these little tweaks, you know, like if you implement five or six of those little tweaks, then you're at 15 to 25% more likely to get in the door, which means that I'm 15 to 25% more likely to start closing more deals, you know, and sooner, like, you know, sooner rather than later you're actually having to knock on fewer doors like towards the end there I was pretty confident that if you put me on a street within the next 10 doors I can walk away with a deal yeah you know what I mean like within yeah. an hour hour and a half um, just depending on the time of day and the neighborhood uh, but you know we obviously got a way better at picking neighborhoods and, and, and all that kind of stuff so you know it's a fun time like I said there's a lot of fond memories uh, with all that kind of stuff I would I uh, I'm happy I don't do it anymore but I I do have a, a lot of a lot of good memories from that time we attribute it. There's some people that made it to what we called ownership, which was like 1% of the people that came in for interviews could do. And then there was people that less percentage of that, that made it to a promoting owner where they would put out other offices. And that's kind of where, where we were. And we, we, we talk about it. We're like, it was almost like the Navy SEALs type training, like special forces training for sales because the ability to adapt and learn through the evolution itself, uh, you know, I was prior military. So just being able to get out into the neighborhood and, learn as you go. And like you say, get paid as you go. So it's, right. it's, 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 for some people, it was probably a better move than college was because. Oh, sure. Sure. You know, so. I think, it, I think it's Brian Tracy, uh, one of the top sales trainers out there. I, I want to say it's Brian Tracy. Um, but, uh, uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that. If, if, if you're listening to this and you're Googling it right now. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, I think it was Brian Tracy that said that two years of door to door is way more valuable than a four year college degree or something like that. But he specifically addressed door to door and said like, look, if, if you want to like learn people, and you want to learn how to be successful in business, do two years of door to door. Don't go to college, um, which, which is, uh, I think pretty, pretty sound advice. Yep. Outside of being uh, you know, a doctor or something where you have to have that sure, sure. training. Yeah. I, yeah I business can, success. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Entrepreneurial yeah. sales type stuff. Yeah. Yep. And it's amazing that like you said, 50 to hundred contacts in a day, you know, B2B, it was a little bit more because there was more people to see in a business. It wasn't just the home itself. Right. And so, um, you know, you we were talking to the decision maker. Absolutely. And like we trickled our way down from the decision maker to the employees and like whoever we could talk to and having those micro interactions every day, a hundred interactions a day, every day. And we were doing this six days a week, you know, 600 different face-to-face -face interactions. Those cues and clues, like you mentioned, the, the, the factors of impulse is what we used to call them, how to kind of get people to over, you know, like get them to make a decision or, 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 or steer the conversation. Um, there was, there was all these little things that you learn every single day. And I couldn't agree more. I think that, uh, outside sales for anybody who wants to be better in business, be better in relationships, be better. Um, just even in conversation because you meet so many different people and you learn so much so fast. Um, and then for you, you kind of changed your paradigm on, on the thought process of the people that were, uh, you know, self helpers, so to speak, the ones that would read the books, but they wouldn't execute. And from what I've heard in a few different points in our conversation, you know, it's good to have the information, but you're a guy who's all about execution. You're the guy who wants to take the information that you're learning in these books and apply it and like do it well. And sure. you did that yeah. through John Lee Dumas was one of the first people you mentioned. 
Is, is mm -hmm. that someone who you went to? Is, did he become a direct mentor to you or was there someone that he was involved with that you learned from? Yeah. So podcasting specifically, he introduced me to a guy named Jeff Brown because he wasn't doing one-on-one -on -one podcast coaching anymore. Um, so Jeff was my podcast coach and Jeff's a great podcast coach, uh, but he didn't teach any of the business side of, of the online world or business side of podcasting. So I knew that I needed to get that aspect as well. And uh, so I got, I went to a mastermind at JLD's house in Puerto Rico, um, after like a month after I finished coaching with Jeff and, um, and, and now, yeah, yeah. JLD has become a, you know, a good friend and a, a constant, a constant mentor in my life. Somebody, when I run into something, I can shoot him a quick text and he'll give me an answer and been a, been a very, uh, an invaluable relationship for sure. Yeah, no, that's, that's huge. And for me, I've always been a seeker of knowledge and information because I end up turning around and, and using it in my business or sharing it with other people. And so that's a lot of that's come through, like you mentioned, audiobooks and now podcast and coaches and mentors specifically. And my coach and mentor is a gentleman who um, I feel like he, his name is Patrick Tucker. He's an investment advisor. I'm an investment advisor. He's out in Omaha and he's someone who's basically the 20 year older version of me. Like, like there's a lot of mm. things that um, there's differences, which is great but there's a lot of similarities. And so, you know, through his coaching and mentorship, um, I've been able to fast forward the learning curve specifically in my industry, because there's a lot of smart people out there, but I want to align myself with people that have achieved what I'm looking to achieve at a high level. Yeah. And so for you, the importance of mentors, the importance of having a coach, the importance of, you know, gaining that information, you know, what does that look like for you and, and, and how have you applied that in your life and your business? Yeah, I think it's everything, man. I, I think, uh, if you want success in a certain field and somebody else has done it on the level that you want to do it on, get to know them, like however you can. That was my end goal with John. I was just like, this guy's clearly figured out this business podcasting thing. I need to figure out a way to get around him and learn from him. And like, you can't help but learn from those people, even if you're just rubbing shoulders with them. Not like, even if you don't like, like John, for instance, he doesn't do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So there was no way for me to be like, Hey, can you do one-on-one -on -one coaching with me? Because he would just say, no, I don't do that anymore. Um, so I knew I had to get creative if I wanted to learn from him. And like, just kept my eyes open, went to that initial mastermind, looked for a couple of different ways that I could add value to him while I was out there, did those things, got around him more and created a real relationship, a real friendship where now there's like a mutual value add where I've been able to like make a couple intros and like help out a little bit here when I can. And like, it's all about that like value exchange is what is really cr creating like real relationships. Um, and so like, yeah, if somebody's figured it out, just go get around that person and, and, and learn from them. Like, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you want to learn, uh, how to be a better golfer. And so there's three different options. Let's say you go golfing every single week. Just you, you golf one round of golf per week for 52 weeks for an entire year and do that by yourself. Will you get better? Yeah. I think you'll get better. Uh, and, and a lot of golfers will be like, well, you got to be five times a week because golf is a hard sport. Like I understand the premise. Okay. Just follow me through. This is just an example. Okay. So don't get, nit don't, don't get nitty gritty with me. Okay. So, so one time a week, whatever it is, you will get better if you go golfing by yourself, right? You're just doing your repetition. You're getting better. Or, or let's say you also are going to go golfing one, once a week for an entire year with three people who are all worse than you at golf. Will you get better? Yeah you're still going to get better because you're going out and you're golfing and you're getting that repetition in. But let's say you go golfing every year, once a week with three people who are much better than you at golf. Are you going to get better? Yes. And exponentially so because every time you're out, you're learning from people who are much better than you at the thing that you're trying to get good at. So like, even like I said, even if they're not even like specifically giving you coaching lessons and golfing lessons, just the way that they talk, the conversations around golf, the things that they say, like you'll pick up on little things, just being around those people where it's like, Oh, I need to implement that in my short game. Or like, man, I, I need to, I need to spend a little bit more time on my woods or my irons. Like there's going to be things that you're going to pick up just from like being around those types of people and the way that they talk about the things that they know a lot about. Um, so yeah, a coach and a mentor is, it's the same thing, man. Like if you really want that level of success, you should get around the people that are doing it at the highest level. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to be guaranteed because you still have to put in the work. That's the thing that a lot of people confuse with coaching is they'll hire a coach and then think it's going to guarantee them instant success. 
And that's not how it works. You still have to be willing to put in a lot of the work. And if you look at my relationship with John, it's very much been like that. Like, like even John would tell you that, that like, if you asked him that he was, took like a, a back seat in terms of how, what I did with my show, like he helped every once in a while. Sure. He provided some support. He made a couple intros, stuff like that. Yeah. Great. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that was busting my ass and trying to make sure that I implemented all the things that I was picking up when I would, when I would spend time with him and, and, his, and his, uh, his girl, Kate, um, who's also a, a, you know, super knowledgeable and all this stuff too. So um, it's definitely a two-part there. But um, yeah, I, 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 you know, getting a coach, getting a mentor, somebody who's been there, done that, walked the same uh, path that you're trying to walk is, uh, is uh, you know, I wouldn't say vital to your success, but I would say if you want success faster, then hire a coach, get around people who are doing it at the highest level. And, and this may seem like a normal kind of status quo because we've been in this, this side of things for a while with reaching out and building your network, which we're, I want to talk about here in a second, you know, in general, but um, for someone who is looking to hire a coach, um, you know, you're a consultant, people hire you for what you can teach them. Um, how, you know, how would they approach them? What's the best way to approach someone that you want to work with in that capacity? If you want to hire somebody as a coach, um, it's so hard to answer that question because I think it's totally different depending on, you know, your industry and what you're looking to get out of it. You know, there's, there's life coaches that just coach you on how to live life better. Um, there's specific business coaches, there's health coaches, there's like a lot of different avenues there. So, um, I think just, you got to be smart about it. You can't, everybody's a coach these days. So you can't just go hire somebody just because they're a coach. Right. Um, make sure that they're vetted well. Usually a good indicator is to go see who the people are, not necessarily that they've coached, but the people who endorse them, the people who they spend time with, are they good people? Do they typically work on a higher level? Um, like, do they get results for their students that they've already had? There's, there's a few things like that that you really want to be mindful of. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're always scared to pull the trigger, you're just going to build the habit of being scared to pull the trigger. So like for me personally, I would rather spend the money and like do the thing. And then if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, but I learned a lesson and I can move on to the next thing. Like, I just think that I think success loves speed. And sometimes you just got to like act quickly without taking five months to think about it. Obviously if it's like a crazy huge thing, like recently I joined a, a, a mastermind that was a hundred thousand dollars to join. That was not an overnight decision for me. Like I, I took a few months to ponder that one um, because it's a little bit bigger of an investment, obviously. Uh, but, you know, these thousand dollar one offs or like a two thousand dollar thing or five hundred bucks, like don't let don't let teeny tiny dollar amounts like that stand in the way of your dreams. Meaning that if you're somebody that makes 50 K a year and right now a thousand dollars to you is a lot of money. Like, sure. I can, I can totally empathize with that. I get it. Right. But at the same time, if your goal is to go from $50,000 a year and in the next five years, you want to be making $2 million a year or $500,000 a year or $1 million a year. Like you have to be thinking with the mindset of the person that's at the level that you want to be on in order to get to the level that you want to be on. It's not the other way around. You don't get to that level and then start thinking like that person. You have to think like that person and then that helps you get to the next level. So if you're, you know, making 50 grand a year and you're looking at a thousand bucks, like it's a lot of money, you got to think about like, man, my goal is to get to $250,000 next year. Would somebody that makes $250,000 a year, look at a thousand bucks for a coach that could potentially unlock their next level of earning as a lot of money? No. Probably not you know, and they'll probably figure out a way to make it happen. And that's kind of what you, what you gotta, you, you have to have an, a frank and honest conversation with yourself and ask yourself, is that something that you want? And if it is, then you just got to make it happen because, you know, losing a thousand bucks, they're like, there's a lot of worse situations than losing a thousand bucks. It's a thousand bucks. You can always make it back. Yeah. You know, you can't make your time back. And uh, that's what having a coach and a mentor allows you to do is, is skip a lot of the time that would have taken you to try to figure it out on your own. I agree. And it's completely the scarcity versus the abundance mindset. It's, you know, your, your, your pension penny step, pension, pension penny stepping over dollars, which, you know, you can have somebody accelerate your ability to earn more, to grow more, to be a better person, um, to leave the world a little bit of a better place. And it's all about that fear, which really doesn't exist that people just place on themselves as a limiting factor. But I agree, man. And I would say just reach out to them, DM someone, uh, you know, get someone, you know, you know, like has a common connection and say, Hey, can you make an introduction for me? Or how can I help you add value to them first? And then maybe they'll feel the need to add value back. So in that vein of building your network, that's the name of your podcast, right? The, the, it's yeah. a, and so talk to me about the inception of the idea for the podcast. Talk to me about 
how you actually have seen this work in your life with, you know, your, your mindset and your philosophy on networking uh, and just walk us down the path of of that whole process. Yeah. So it's a lot less um, like planned out than, uh, than most people think it was. I, I literally was just like, I want to start a podcast. And I was like, what am I going to talk about? I'm 23. Nobody's going to want to listen to me. And I was like, well, you know, I'm pretty decent at the sales thing. Maybe I should start something in sales. And so I go to iTunes and I type in sales. And then there's like 100,000 results of like just an insane saturation of sales podcasts. And the one thing that I did learn from JLD just from listening to him was that if you want like the riches are in the niches, if you want to, you know, gain an audience, you have to niche down and find something that nobody else is doing. You have to go find that blue ocean. <clears throat> so I uh, was just kind of back to the drawing board and I was just like, man, what do I do now? I, I, what, like, so I just started asking myself, Hey, what would I attribute, you know, <clears throat> my six figure year in sales last year, what would I attribute that to? And I asked myself that question and it was like, well, sales. Okay. Yeah, sure. But what, like, how did you get good at that though? Like, what's the, how did you learn that skill set? And, uh, the obvious answer to me was that I got around a guy, the owner of that company who was really my first, you know, business mentor, sales mentor to this day, one of the best salesmen I've ever met in my life. And, uh, I just got around him and I learned from him. And I, I spent as much time with him as I possibly could. Like anytime there was a party at his house, I was there. Anytime there was an invite to go somewhere, like I went and did it. Like I was just trying to get around him as much as possible so that I could soak up any sort of like little nuggets that I could along the way. Anytime I was in the field and I ran into something I didn't know, I'd shoot him a text. Hey, how did you overcome this? Hey, what do you say to somebody when they say this? And I just used it as a, as a lifeline, man. I just kind of, I just kept asking more and more questions. And so I was like, huh. And so the way that I, as 20, as a 22 year old built a six figure income was by getting around somebody who had done it really well and learning from them. That's networking, right? So I was like, oh, I could start a show about networking because then I could talk to people and ask them about networking. And at the same time, I'm also networking, right? So I thought that was kind of cool. And I looked at iTunes, figuring that there had to be another 100,000 podcasts on networking, just like sales. And there just wasn't. There was essentially zero that's focused only on that topic, on that one individual topic. Um, and, uh, when I searched for it, I couldn't find anything. And so I was just like, okay, there it is. There's, there's the blue ocean for me. And I just kind of went with it. Um, so it was a lot less strategic than most people think it was. I was just kind of like, yeah, I'm not going to do sales. What do I do? You know? Um, and, uh, that's why like at the beginning, I never, I never really branded myself as a networking expert because I wasn't, I'd never even been to an event, like a regular, like I'd never even been to an industry event or business event before. Um, so the cool, that's the cool thing about podcasting and content creation though, is that you don't have to be the expert as long as you don't tell everybody that you're the expert and do the fake it till you make it, you know, bull crap. Like then just be honest, like, Hey, we're on this journey together. That's what I, that's what I would say to people. Like, this is like, like join me on my networking journey. Like this is a journey. Like I'm, I'm just the captain of the ship, right? Like I'm taking us in this direction and I'm trying to learn about it just as much as everybody else is trying to learn about it. That's why I only did guesting, uh, for the first 150, I think episodes of my show. Uh, it was all guests three a week because I didn't think that I had the expertise to offer. So I just got people on who I thought were good at it and asked them questions. And uh, it was very much of like, a, I'm an investigative reporter type of a stance from a content creation perspective. Uh, but what happens is people start to pair your name with the topic that you talk about the most. And people started calling me a networking expert. And I was like, I'm not even good at this stuff. You know what I mean? And so, uh, but that's kind of how it was born. It was just, it was just like a, a sales was too saturated. So let me do this other thing, you know? Yep. No, it's clever too. And it's, it's, it's on the job training like you had when you're doing door-to-door sales. I mean, you're learning yep. as you go, right. you're networking as you go, you're, you're, you're innovating, you're falling flat on your face, but you're not giving up and you're, and you're, and you're, you're adapting. And so for those of those you know, listeners, there's a lot of people here that are either podcasters themselves, have been on podcasts or starting a podcast. You've kind of gotten into a little bit of that, of how, how that happened for you. But what are some of the things, um, you know, and I absolutely um, implore people reaching out to you directly and, you know, as a capacity of a consultant, whatever, but what are some of the nuggets you can spread around in terms of starting a podcast, like maybe a couple little things like what to do, what not to do kind of thing? Sure. So we already talked about the niche. Um, you gotta, you gotta find the niche. Um, and then the biggest thing that I could say to anybody that wants to create content, um, and actually be successful with it is consistent quality content with context. That's it. That's the simplest way to make sure to guarantee success is consistent quality content with context. So it has to be consistent. 
It has to be quality and it has to be in front of the right people. That's the niching part. Um, you can put out consistent quality content for the wrong people and it's never going to gain traction. So you have to have the audience there. You have to have context, but it also has to be consistent and it has to be quality and you can't sacrifice either one of those. So people are like, well, how long, how many episodes should I release? And I say, well, as many as you possibly can without sacrificing quality or consistency. So like don't release five a week if you're going to stop releasing five a week in three weeks because it was too much. Like whatever you do, commit to doing it for 12 months. If you can't commit to 12 months of it, then don't do it or scale back, right? Like, well, I, I can't do five days a week for 12 months. Okay, great. Can you do one day a week for 12 months? Can you do twice a month for 12 months? Um, like do something consistent, whatever it is. You have to be consistent and you can't take huge dips in quality. You have to put out quality stuff. Um, you can be super consistent, but if it's horrible content, then it's never going to gain traction either. So the content with context, that's the only way to for sure win every time. Now, define win. That's the, that's the gray area. Like, are, are we talking, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll ever get to a million subscribers on YouTube or that you'll have a hundred thousand downloads a month on your show, but you will build an audience. I don't know how big it's going to be. And I don't know if it's going to take you two years, five years or seven years. But if you do it, if you put out quality, consistent content with context, you will build an audience at some point. Um, and that's why a lot of my coaching centered around like, let's figure out a topic that you're okay with creating content around without seeing results for a long period of time. What's going to be that thing that like, if in five years from now you wake up and you realize that like, you didn't ever really make a lot of money from this, will you still have enjoyed your time doing it? And will you look at it as a waste of time? And if the answer, if, you, if you're if you saying that it would, it would be a waste of time, then maybe you should research something else and do something that fires you up, that's more passionate and just keep this thing as a side hustle in the meantime, you know? So there, there's just so many different ways to go out, go about it and uh, so many different approaches. But yeah, consistent quality content with context, man. If anybody's looking to create content, that's that's the only formula that's guaranteed to, to bring you a W. Yep. And that, that's, uh, it's important to know the, the timeline because, you know, some in, in any iteration, whether it's business, whether it's podcasting, you have these companies that are rockets, you have these podcasts that are rockets, they'll take right off. And then you have these slow burns that could take years to kind of really catch a massive following or make some, some meaningful revenue. And then you have the ones that they, people are doing it because the passion's there um, and it does other things. Like, you know, for me and, and what I've seen on a few different scales, one of them is um, it's, it's been a great networking tool. It's been the best business card that I can have in an industry where as an investment advisor, I'm not allowed to use testimonials. It's actually against the law. It's a really cool workaround to say, hey, there's some social proof. There's this guy, he talks to these people. And a lot of these people that come on the show um, we'll then turn around and say, well, tell me about your business. Tell me about this. And like, it'll be somewhere we can help each other outside of that. So it's been this really great way to engage with people uh, and build kind of this, this, this branding, so to speak. So um, for those that are listening, there are different stages, there's different value that you can get along. And even if it's just meeting for you and you're being selfish, you know, I listen to a lot of Joe Rogan and he has people that he comes on, he learns from, you know, people that come on his show and he's just inquisitive about this topic and he wants to delve deeper into here. And you know, just your life experience. So there could be the money making from it. There could be the, the residual, the marketing, the branding, or there could be just like, Hey, it's a hell of a good time to have a good conversation about something kind of thing from it. Yeah. Yep. 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 yep exactly. So, so for the, the podcast, for what you've been able to do, were you able to, you know, did you, cause it sounded like you learned as you, as you went, were you able to monetize fairly quickly? How did that look? And like, like some of those things, like in the podcasting world for people that may be trying to get into this, that are into this, but they haven't gotten there yet, monetizing through sponsorships or collaborations, things like this. Talk to a little bit about like your experience with that and like kind of some things to look for as you go down the road. Yeah, I monetized pretty quickly. Uh, I was probably like five months in when I did my first like monetization piece. Um, and it was my own product. So if you're going to monetize a podcast when you have fewer than 5,000 downloads an episode, which is probably 95% of iTunes, sure. really the only way to do it is through creating your own products or services or being an affiliate for other people's products and services. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was a mastermind. It was the very first thing that I launched. Uh, I made basically zero money on it, uh, but it was a huge learning process for me. It was the first time I ever put something like that together. And I made sure that I delivered on the people that trusted me enough to give me their money at the time. Um, but yeah, no, I, I charged like a thousand bucks for three months and then I, I bought all of them tickets to 10 X growth con that year, which was like 800 bucks a spot. Yeah. So I 
We did like three months of work for free. Um, but uh, like I said, it delivered results. And a lot of those people are still in uh, my mastermind groups to this day because, you know, when they, they knew I started building that reputation that if you spend money with me, you're going to, it's going to pay off. And if not, I'll give you your money back type of a thing. Um, so I built that relationship with those people, you know, from the very beginning, but that was the first one was five, five months in. Um, and then after that one was probably the first time that I actually, you know, I probably got like seven or eight people in the second one and it was like 500 bucks a month. So it was like real, it started being like, okay, this is like actually pretty like decent income coming in. At the time I was still doing door to door. I managed a team. I was a sub dealer for a water purification company. And so I was still selling a little bit myself and I had a team of four or five reps that I managed that were selling deals. So that was my main income stream and the podcasting stuff was all on the side. So bringing in a few extra thousand bucks was just kind of proving the model to me and uh, proving that it was something that I would be able to do going forward. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was, that was the first monetization pieces for me with my own products and services. And then, like I said, unless you got, you know, a lot of the ad, um, the companies that sell ad space on podcasts, they won't even, they won't even talk to you unless you have like a minimum of 10,000 downloads per episode, not per month. Yeah. So, uh, um, so a lot of people will, will never get to that spot and that's okay. Uh, just realizing that, uh, building your audience, as long as you build an audience that is engaged with you, that cares about what you do and that you add real value to, you don't need to get those, to, to those types of numbers to be able to monetize to the high six and even, you know, seven figures at that point. Yep. No. Um, and in terms of like what you've seen your, your podcast, how has it transformed your life? I know there's a lot that it's done for you, but, uh, what has it done? Yeah, countless things, man. I mean, I, I was able to stop doing door to door uh, October of 2018. Uh, so 2019 was my first full year um, in this space, and I, you know, almost tripled my best year ever in sales uh, through the podcast revenue. Um, and I get to do it from like right now I'm in my home office. Like when I get off this interview, I can go hold my son and eat lunch with my wife and um, jump on another interview. I, I can do it from anywhere in the world, um, get to travel and enjoy a lot of time freedom. I make more money than I ever have. Um, I've had conversations with people that I never thought would have a conversation with me. Um, people like some people that are actually like really well known known across, you know, a, a lot of the country. Um, even like, even, I just got back yesterday from interviewing Tommy Laren in New York, who's like a, a, a host on Fox Nation. And, uh, you know, regardless of what you think of her political beliefs, she's obviously built a good career and um, she's very, very well known. And like to be able to have conversations with people like that, I just never thought, you know, I, I, I had hoped that that would be possible. Um, and I believed that I could do it, but like to, uh, to be able to actually do that and to have a bunch of people in my Rolodex now that I can reach out to and get responses from um, is, is, you know, priceless. So um, it, it's done, you know, it's completely been a life changer, complete game changer for me. For sure. And in and, and having that freedom um, of time with family and, and like the most important things that, that come from it is what it's all for. It's nice to have the the revenue. It's nice to have, you know, the accolades, but at the end of the day, if you can have more time with baby and mom and whoever, the, whoever's in your life, that's important to you, that's yep. the game, right? Yep. So, so um, in terms of, you know, you mentioned kind of really quickly, and we got a few more minutes here, you mentioned about your mastermind and I've seen pictures of this through Zach. Zach goes to your masterminds and like you guys are like snowboarding and throwing each other in snow, but you're also learning and doing some really great work too. Sure. Um, tell us a little bit about your masterminds and what that looks like. Yeah, so I have two masterminds. One of them is called the Inner Circle. Um, this is the highest quality, lower ticket mastermind that I've ever seen in this space. Uh, and I try to do that to make sure that people who maybe either don't have time to commit on a higher level or don't have the money to commit on a higher level um, can still get insane value and connect with people all over the place for 99 bucks a month. Um, and so that's the Inner Circle, um, which you can learn more about at byninnercircle.com. And then I have my uh, Cool People, Cool Places Mastermind, and that's the one that Zach is in. Um, and uh, we basically take a group of people to a cool place. Um, all the people that come in are vetted to be cool people. I've even kicked people out of the group uh, that I didn't <laughs> think would be nice, that I didn't think would be good fits, um, and like fully refunded them. And uh, so I try to my best to keep a really quality group of uh, people that are just like ready to have a good time, but also willing to learn. And uh, then I bring a couple of instructor friends of mine in. Uh, we had a seven figure guy, multi seven a guy that owns a multi seven figure coaching company, and then I had another guy that owns a uh, eight figure supplement company 
uh, come in and uh, just teach on like marketing and sales and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then um, I bring everybody who's in that group, I'm bringing them all onto my show, giving them exposure into my audience, uh, which is a big uh, value add there. Um, and then we're doing a Costa Rica trip at the end of the, at the end of this, that's all inclusive that I'm bringing other speakers in to spend like four or five days with us in Costa Rica, mapping out businesses and doing all that good stuff. And then on top of all of that, we have weekly calls uh, that we're, I'm jumping on in a, in a little bit. That's basically like group coaching where I, you know, teach them an aspect of something that I'm working on that they can put in their businesses. Um, so yeah, the, the, uh, this group is like, this group is like my, my people, man. Like I, I spend a lot of time with all of them and I, I make sure all of them get what they need from me and uh, make sure that all of them are successful. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it's, I, I love, love spending time with, with the, with the cool people group. It's just a lot of fun uh, for me. And uh, a lot of people are seeing some, some really big results and we're only five weeks in right now. So incredible. Be, excited. Being able to enjoy your life, build a business you want, surround yourself with a community of people that you want to grow with. I mean, life doesn't get much better than that, man. So um, for you and, and, and for um, a couple things, so go home message for people that are listening that, that may be in the space of building something, creating something specifically a podcast potentially, um, or just anywhere in life that they're looking to adapt and grow. Uh, it's kind of the, the narrative of our conversation here. What would you leave for them in terms of some words of advice or some go home uh, value add for them? Oh man. Uh, it's so hard sometimes to give like a blanket statement, but I would say, uh, I would say become a person of value. Always, always add at least 51% of the value in every relationship that you have. Um, if you do that, you know, life will be good to you. If it's just putting out good things into the universe, a lot of people want to track that stuff and you can't really track it because that's not how the world works. That's not, you know, whatever, whatever you believe, God, the universe, um, whatever the, whatever your belief system is like, um, it's going to come back on you. If you just lead with value and don't expect things in return from people, um, good things are going to come to you. And it may not be directly from the person that you helped out. It might just be a random thing that comes in that was an opportunity um, that just came out of nowhere. Like you just, just lead with value, be good to people. Um, always try to add at least 51% of the value in every relationship that you're in. And uh, I think, you know, good things are going to continue to happen for you. I love it, brother. And for people that want to follow more of what you're doing, get to the podcast, learn more about you and maybe your consulting business, uh, how would they find you? Yeah, TravisChapel.com is everything. C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L. TravisChapel.com uh, has everything there. All my social links are over there. Um, my email address is over there. You can either, uh, email me directly, shoot me a DM on Instagram um, or, you know, however you'd like to get, get a hold of me. But, uh, with the, with the consultation stuff, basically what we're doing now is like a done for you podcast in a box setup, um, where we charge you one flat fee and we build out a podcast for you. We do do some marketing for you and we make sure that it's successful. Um, so it's mainly, you know, targeted towards six and seven figure business owners, people that already have a back end offer that are, they're selling something that this can kind of be a lead generation engine for, um, uh, where that's who we, we mainly are working with. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, then uh, just head over to travischapel.com slash coaching. And uh, there's a quick little form there and then I'll hop on a call with you and, and uh, we, we'll see if, see if it's be a good fit for, uh, for, for us to do that for you and your business. So. That's uh, extremely insightful, brother. And thank you so much for sharing your time, sharing your vision, sharing your, your, your mission and what you've been able to help and leave the world a little bit of a better place through each micro interaction, I think is kind of the game. And so thanks so much. And um, everybody who's listening, be sure to check out Travis on all his social media, all his uh, iterations from websites. And if you, if you need some help anywhere in those, those places, definitely contact this man. He knows what he's doing. I'm Jesse T. He's the amazing, mighty, and powerful Travis Chapel. Be sure to catch us on the newest episode of the Jesse T Show. Thank you.